Yeah. Um, okay. Let's let's continue. And it's my my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, um, Fumi Aida from Cambridge University. And um, actually, um, I know Fumi for a long time already. So we did our PhDs together at the University of Zurich, and um, so I know uh, his recent work very well. And I'm very interested in the, in the new developments that have been done in, at Cambridge University now on challenges and perspectives on morphology between robots. And for me, the floor is all yours. OK, well, uh, thank you very much. I, I hope uh, you, you, you hear well. I, I, I hear a bit of echo, but. Um, yeah, now it's better. OK, great. So um, what I'm going to uh, talk about is uh, a bit of background why I started this research on morphology changing robot. I think Verena um, gave a, a very wonderful lecture uh, this morning or this afternoon um, about how um, morphology could be optimized. But from robotics research perspective, it's quite a challenging still how to make uh, a robot changing morphology autonomously. So um, that's a kind of thing I have been working in the last five or six years. And uh, I, I want to tell you a bit more about uh, what's the state of the art and where uh, we can go uh, from here on. So um, the starting point of my uh, research was actually um, a bio-inspired robotics uh, research on uh, insects. So in particular, um, uh, I worked with uh, Rolf Pfeiffer and other colleagues in the University of Zurich to explore how we can build robots like you know, the, the honeybees. Honeybees are known to be very uh, intelligent insect, even though uh, they're very uh, small size and, and comparative sim simplicity in their uh, um, uh, mechanical structures. So if you look at brain size, for example, it's uh, about one ten thousandth of uh, humans. So it's significantly much simpler. And uh, you know, even if you have ten thousand of bees, the number of neurons there is not much uh, more than what we have in one uh, uh, um, adult human. But uh, even though they have very um, restricted size in capacity of computational power in, in brain, um, they can do remarkable things such as uh, forage uh, navigation uh, over several kilometers uh, away, um, which is equivalent to you know uh, traveling to 100 kilometer um, for humans. <coughs> Excuse me and. Uh, and, and even without you know maps and the GPS and all uh, all this uh, useful tools uh, in for for humans, they can travel so long distance. And at the same time, they can also come back after after this forest travel uh, because they are living in hive, and that's also another incredible uh, feature that what they can do. And on top of that, they have a, a lot of other uh, intelligent um, intelligent uh, behaviors such as communicating by using more than hundreds of um, uh, symbolic wires and so on. So uh, we started thinking about how what we can learn from this kind of animals and what we can, uh, how we can improve our robotics technology knowing all these things, incredible things in nature. And one of the um, aspects we were interested in is uh, how we deal with um, uh, sensory system, especially uh, visual sensory system, because insects are, uh, are heavily relying on the sensory system they have. So in particular, the morphological structure is a very uh, playing important role uh, because of the relative size of the brain. So if you look at uh, different kind of insects, they've, they've, they have different kind of uh, visual um, setup. So what they have in particular interest, interesting is the um, uh, morphology of facets. So they have uh, uh, um, hundreds of photoreceptors, but they're not. Uh, placed in a homogeneous manner like the cameras we usually use in engineering world, 
but um, they have var uh, variations of uh, morphology that gives different kind of sensory stimuli uh, in order to simplify the um, uh, visual information processing. So uh, some of the evidences in, in uh, biology that how uh, insects use visual information for their navigation. So one of the examples is done by uh, the, the champion of this field, uh, Mandiam Srinivasan from Australia. He had uh, hundreds of different kind of experiments uh, showing how visual information are used. So in this particular case, uh, showing the slide, um, the bees are respond. Uh, the, the uh, navigation uh, strategy or the core stabilization behavior of the honeybees depending on how this, um, the spatial visual stimuli uh, in the environment. So in this particular case, um, they set up the environment such that bees are, are, um, can course, stabilize its course in different ways. So in one case, they have um, a, the same spatial frequency of the stripes in, in the environment uh, and different uh, spatial uh, frequency on the right hand side and left hand side. Um, and regardless of this condition, um, the, the honeybee can um, stabilize the course in the middle of the tunnel, whereas as soon as they change the speed of the, of the uh, temporal uh, frequency of the stripe, the honeybee started uh, deviating their course in the environment. So that gives the, some idea about how spatial temporal uh, frequency of the visual stimuli is very important for stabilizing uh, their uh, flight um, in, in, in nature. And another example uh, that Shreen Yosan showed <coughs> was the, uh, the learning capability of navigation. And so in this particular case, Hanabi was trained to uh, find the reward in certain location in the tunnel, in the experimental tunnel. And they changed uh, um, the, again the spatial uh, um, um, uh, yes the spatial frequency of the tunnel and see how the honeybee was confused to uh, reach to the certain location. So in this case, they changed the, uh, the uh, width of the tunnel, and if you make it wider or narrower, the uh, honeybee. Uh, measure the distance they thrown uh, in different ways. So if you make it wider tunnel, they deceive that it flies longer than they thought, and that's why they try to get the reward in the, um, the longer distance and vice versa. So in this case, the uh, honeybee uses the visual odometry using uh, a vision to measure the distance it thrown. Uh, but it's, that depends on the, uh, 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 the spatial frequency of the environment. So this comes. Uh, uh, so there are a lot of reasons why uh, honeybees use uh, vision. So here uh, is some of the examples and, and evidences found in nature that honeybee uses vision for uh, for their uh, survival. So do, they do route learning go direct navigation all the way from the very low level uh, motion control problems like obstacle avoidance, altitude control, speed control, landing, odometry, landmark navigation, pattern recognition, and so on and so forth. But we see that this all yellow uh, boxes here are um, the functions that uh, take advantage of uh, visual uh, input in, in the insect. So um, the, the insect uh, relies on visual, visual input, but um, uh, for their navigation uh, purposes. But the question is, how can they use all this uh, visual information, which is usually regarded as very um, challenging uh, problem of uh, sen sensory information processing? But they have remarkably small brain to do all these things, and that was the kind of background information why we are interested in um, uh, the. Uh, the topic of sensor uh, morphology in, in insect in the context of insect navigation. So, um, uh, yeah, so here is the video uh, that how uh, the motion can tell us uh, about our, mo um, our own body motion. So that the trick of the honeybees uh, or other insects uh, good at navigate, being good at navigation is the fact that they're relying on the motion perception. So they use 
uh, what they call optic flow. So if just by looking at stripe moving around, you can immediately realize how um, our uh, own body motion uh, should be. So in the uh, in the, the leftmost case, the mo the, the left uh, video that shows the stripe moving from bottom to uh, the top, that means that our body is going actually backwards. And if the stripe moving from left hand side to right hand side in the middle figure, uh, we know that our body is drifting for left hand side. And put them together, we know that our body is uh, moving uh, backward left hand side. Um, and that is uh, the kind of motion uh, cue they can use to do uh, navigation uh, problems. And I move to the, the, um, the next slide. So this actually tells um, how ISS are actually measuring the motion. So it can be actually uh, relatively easily achieved how to measure uh, motion. So in this case, this shows that if you have two photoreceptors and high pass and low pass fi uh, filters, um, these two photoreceptors can tell us about uh, which um, the light is moving to. Uh, so direction information is there as well as the speed uh, can be detect detected depending on what kind of uh, high pass and low pass filter you can have. So this is what we, uh, what they discover in insect uh, vision they call the motion, uh, elementary motion detector. A uh, very simple uh, circuit, but this is very powerful to be used to na navigate, do navigation of uh, insects. So, uh, and on top of that, there's a, um, another um, uh, principle important to uh, understand the spatial uh, relationship between uh, environment and its own, uh, own uh, motion, uh, which is called the motion parallax. So this was uh, originally uh, proposed uh, by many um, uh, mathematicians and uh, 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 a biologist, but more recently used by um, the Nicolas Francis Keeney from France. Uh, uh, he demonstrated a robot can take advantage of this, this principle of motion parallax for navigation pro problem. So in this particular case, the, uh, the robot is moving uh, forward, looking at um, object on the, um, the top left corner. But as the, as the robot moving towards that object at the beginning, uh, the motion of this object was very, very uh, slow because the object looks like uh, uh, projected on the frontal part of the visual stimuli, uh, uh, whereas it, as the system goes more toward the object, the, the uh, object goes uh, looks on the uh, left-hand side, the lateral uh, visual feed of the uh, insect, so therefore it moves much, much faster. So by looking at, by thinking about this geometric structure as well as uh, um, the motion, apparent motion on the visual uh, retina, then uh, we can, uh, the, the robot can identify how fast it is moving as well as the spatial uh, relationship between the robot and the object. So by using this uh, trick, um, insect can actually uh, simplify the control problem of some of the control problem of their uh, motion um, for their survival. So if you go to the next slide, this is an example um, of this kind shown by uh, Lucas Lichtensteiger and Peter Negenberger at the uh, Artificial Intelligence Laboratory in University of Zurich uh, quite some time ago, but it really shows the principle that how the uh, sensor morphology of the uh, robot could be important. So this robot has uh, a series of um, uh, photoreceptors uh, hidden under these pipes. So there are 13 or 14 pipes aligned in a vertical line, and, um, and that is able to change the direction of the photoreceptors by using a motor system. So the robot, uh, actually there should be a, a video here which is not shown, uh, but this robot can move uh, uh, back and forth in the horizontal direction uh, in front of the uh, light uh, tube. Um, and every time it tries to uh, do locomotion, it shows, uh, try to change the um, morphology of this, uh, the photoreceptor so that it can uh, tune the, um, uh, the, the distribution of photoreceptors. So depending on what criteria it gives, the uh, distribution of photoreceptor is, uh, 
can be evolved in different way. Just go to the next slide. Uh, it shows um, the, uh, the the two different uh, results from the evolution experiment. In the first case, on top uh, on top of the figure, uh, this is the evolution results uh, when the fitness function is uh, defined as constant distance to the object. So if the, um, the, insect, the, the robot or insect try to feel um, uh, maintain the uh, constant distance of the object, this is a sensor morphology perfect for uh, this kind of task. And if the fitness function is, different, uh, is set to constant velocity toward the object, which is the trade-off uh, relationship to the uh, distance, and then the, uh, the sensor morphology is very uh, different. So by having this kind of two cases uh, of sensor morphology, um, the, uh, insect can behave in very different ways. So if you, the insect have a sensor morphology in the top case, the uh, insect try to uh, maintain the distance from the object uh, without much of the control uh, computation in the brain. Whereas uh, in the lower case, uh, if the sensor morphology has the lower case um, shape and then uh, insect uh, end up with uh, behaving behavior with constant velocity rather than maintaining distance in the object. So hopefully um, <coughs> with this example, we can show how the, um, the morphology and the behavior is related to each other. So this is the, uh, another example we are uh, showing, uh, we showed in um, the navigation problem of the honeybee. So the, in this case, the um, we built a, a flying robot with a, a balloon, and then in, in this uh, robot, we implemented an omnidirectional vision in the, in the system that, so that the uh, robot can see 360 degrees around the environment, which is similar to what insects actually uh, uh, observe in nature from their perspective. Um, so we implemented this um, the omnidirectional camera on the uh, Zeppelin, and uh, uh, um, and analyze what, what would be the best uh, optimal uh, distribution of photoreceptors on this camera. So we implemented the visual um, uh, elementary motion detector for the uh, visual pro information processing on top of this uh, omnidirectional camera and see how um, optical avoidance and visual odometry that work in this uh, kind of system. So obviously, the sensor morphology is very important here because, uh, and that, that's the reason why implement is omnidirectional um, uh, camera in this robot. So um, if you look at the nature, um, the morphology, uh, sensor morphology and behaviors are so uh, much related. So if you look at different kind of species of insects, such as you know, honeybees and dragonfly, they already have a different uh, sensor morphology, the distribution of photoreceptors, uh, because they uh, behave in different way and they, uh, they require different kind of functions for their survival. Um, and the same holds true for the different genders. So if the, uh, uh, look at the different genders of bees, the drone bees and worker bees, um, they uh, obviously have different uh, distribution of uh, photoreceptors. Um, and uh, that actually uh, tells us the importance of sensor morphology in the survival of all this insect in, uh, in nature. So uh, in general, um, this principle of sensor morphology applies to many different kind of uh, sensor modalities, not only for vision, but also for auditory system or tactile systems, such as the whiskers of um, rodents or a morphology of um, antenna in insects also play an important role. So morphology in general is very uh, playing an important role in nature. So that's why we wanted to learn uh, this aspect from nature to improve our robotic systems. Uh, but in general, uh, sensor morphology, um, in, in the context of sensor morphology, uh, morphologies uh, can filter, amplify, and convert physical stimuli for sensing. So um, that, that's very important for animals to um, understand the nature through morphology, um, because if you don't have morphology, you can, uh, the, the capacity of sensing can be very, very limited. 
So, um, the, from robotics perspective, one of the biggest challenges is how we can make robots change in their own morphology autonomously and automatically. So that uh, is the kind of technological aspect we have been working in the last uh, couple of years. And the first example we um, thought about is um, how um, how actually animals uh, changes their morphology uh, in, uh, in the primitive level. And this is the kind of inspiration we had from spider. So if you look at the, the hip of spider, they have a very sophisticated device um, that uh, is used to generate the silks. So the spider generates silk with this kind of system. And, uh, uh, but this is the way how they structure the environment. Um, and they make their own uh, sensory morphology. So the spider web is not just for the, um, the structure they live on, but they use this uh, kind of structure to sense different uh, properties, physical properties of the environment, such as temperature, humidity, or whether you have um, a praise in the uh, web, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So this uh, is highly related to how the robot uh, can take advantage of nature. So uh, what the first example we did um, is this um, inspired from the um, a spider building uh, web structures. Uh, we built a robot uh, that can do 3D printing in the air. So this is what we call the sparse space 3D printing. So we uh, uh, implemented the thermoplastic adhesive um, uh, nozzle in the uh, robotic arm and controlled arm such that uh, it can do 3D printing in the air. Um, and this is the uh, kind of collaboration project with um, uh, spider biology and see how we can do similar thing as um, a spider. But this is one way to structure the environment and making morphology as, uh, as it wants. And so that's the first example we did in our uh, laboratory. <coughs> um, we can, uh, and the way how um, we developed this system, we implemented um, uh, the thermoplastic adhesive nozzle in the uh, robotic arm. And the robotic arm obviously has to think about what kind of design it wants to develop and what kind of uh, construction process it has to uh, do. And on top of that, the robot can also do assembly, the attachment of the structure to the environment is another important aspect. And on top of that, the robot should do also the autonomous operation. So this is the very highly challenging integration uh, problems. And uh, uh, that's uh, what we have been doing in our uh, laboratory. And in the context of sensor morphology, I also have another example here that robot using same technologies but changing uh, its own sensor morphology by itself. So in this case, the robot is making a uh, whisker-like structure, basically a stick attached to its own body and trying to use it for sensing of soft, uh, softness in the object in front of it. So the robot is actually uh, touching a rigid object here and measuring the curvature of the, uh, the stick through the uh, vision, and it can measure the uh, different softness in the, um, in the object in front of it. And this second example here is the morphology used for temperature sensing. So the robot is actually uh, putting this weight in the uh, end effector uh, and because the, uh, the robot, uh, uh, this, uh, this object is thermoplastic, and depending on the temperature we have, uh, the object has, uh, the robot, uh, uh, um, the, the morphology reacts differently. So that's uh, how a robot could take advantage of morphology to measure, this, uh, measure the uh, temperature and also softness um, in different forms. So here is a good example that the robot has only one sensory modality, which is the camera, uh, but, but by changing the morphology of thermoplastic um, material, the robot is able to sense different things in, different, uh, in a different um, amplitude. So um, through this kind of setup, we tested what's the uh, advantage of um, adjustable sensor morphology. Uh, and here's the case study uh, showing the, uh, the, the results uh, from the case study I showed you in the video and the previous slide. So in the upper case, uh, this 
figure shows how the, um, the stick sensor morphology relates to sensing range and sensitivity. So there's always, whatever sensor you use, uh, there's always a trade-off between uh, sensor, uh, sensor range, sensing range and sensitivity. So if you have a sensor with high, high sensitivity, generally the range of sen uh, s sensing is limited. But if you have a large sensing range in the sensor, you usually have uh, less sensitivity in the, uh, in the sensor. So uh, this is the kind of aspects we are, are looking at by, um, uh, by adjustable sensor morphology. So in the top uh, right hand side uh, figure, this um, diagram shows the x-axis, the thickness of the, uh, the whisker. So um, if this thickness is thinner, it becomes more sensitive, whereas it can sense only limited range of, of uh, the uh, softness of the object. Whereas if you have thicker uh, whisker, we have uh, the, the system can measure a large range of uh, sense, uh, sensing, but uh, the resolution is limited. So by having this kind of, sen uh, this, the morphology changing capability in, in, in the robot, the robot is flexibly adjust to the uh, need of sensing with respect to sensing uh, sensitivity and sensing uh, range. And the same holds uh, true for the um, sen uh, temperature sensing. So in this case, the diameter of the attachment point is the uh, morpho important morphology parameters uh, that determines how sensitive to the uh, temperature of the object. So if you change the diameter of attachment point uh, in the smaller diameter, then uh, this mechanism works for smaller range, but more sens sensitivity in different temperature. Whereas uh, if you have a larger diameter attachment point, um, the, uh, the sensing range can become larger, whereas we have to compromise with the sensing uh, sensitivity. So um, I just want to show you another video about how this the sense the morphology changing capability can help the uh, adaptability of the of the robot. So I showed you so far only about the uh, sensor sensing uh, purposes, but this is more for um, uh, behavioral or uh, motion control um, um, capability. So the robot is basically doing 3D printing of uh, objects. So in this case, uh, we have a robot that is able to make a cup and stick, and we can um, uh, glue them together by using the material. So the robot is actually able to make a, a different kind of end effector in, with a very a great uh, flexibility. So in this case, robot is making stick um, and the cup and then assemble them together to make a scoop-like structure to transport water from one cup to the other. Or uh, robot can also make a, a tweezer-like structure so that it can uh, transport different kind of object in different uh, different manners. Um, so the uh, that basically this example uh, illustrate how. Um, the, the morphology changing capability can give a significant advantage in adaptability of robotic systems. Um, another example we're showing here is the, uh, again the spider robot. The spider can use uh, silk for the purpose of locomotion. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, and in this particular case, we are uh, demonstrating how the thickness of drug line uh, can uh, help the adaptability of locomotion capability. So the robot is able to adjust the thickness of uh, silk on the fly so that um, it can locomote in the vertical direction regardless of the payload it has. Um, and I hope that gives another interesting inspiration for how morphology uh, changes can influence the way how a robot behaves also for locomotion uh, purposes. Okay, um, so I hope I uh, convince you to um, convince that the morphology could be, uh, the changing, morphology changing capability could give a, um, a significant um, 
the increase of adaptability in the robot in the future. But so far, what we did is basically a human designing robots. We can uh, uh, such that robot can autonomously change the morphology, but robots are not really designing morphology by themselves, and they are all designed by human, and robots are actually doing autonomously uh, generating morphology uh, design given by human designers. But now the, the question here is how um, robots can design its own morphology, and here we just uh, want to think about how we do, uh, use evolutionary uh, robotics technology that uh, Ferlena gave a lecture um, today. So I'm not going to repeat this, so as Carl Sims uh, did a remarkable um, uh, uh, the demonstration to show the power of evolutionary natural selection process in computer graphics. But now the question for us roboticists is how we can bring all this evolutionary robotics to the real world. So that's what we uh, have been interested in because this is essentially how the computer and robots can be creative, generating design by themselves rather than just repeating the design given by human designers. So what we did in our laboratory is imprint uh, basically the implementing this idea in the real robotic system. So I just want to show you another video in the next slide. It's about the robot inventor. So this is the a robot we built to uh, implement the Carl Sims idea in the real world. So basically the robotic arm manipulating the components are given um, by human, but the components can be assembled in many different ways. The robot is not only manipulating the object, but also assembling the given object in a different manners by using the um, thermoplastic adhesives. So this is actually the hot glue that can connect a given object in different configurations. So the robot is manipulating a given object and putting them together. And after constructed, the robot moves this uh, uh, child robot that we call into a testing arena so that uh, the robot can evaluate the, uh, uh, the robot built uh, already uh, by themselves. So in this, uh, let's see this video once again. So the robot is now assembling two objects together by using hot glue. Uh, but this um, the assembly can be done in many different ways. So the mother robot, uh, we call this a robotic or mother robot because they're making child robot. Um, so the mother robot can generate potentially uh, many, many different uh, variations of the morphological structure uh, by uh, assembling these um, two cubes together. <laughs> So what is not, um, so go back to the slide here. So what is not shown in this video is that, so this mother robot is connected to a central computer behind it. So the, the control PC is not only controlling a mother robot, but also connected to the camera set up in, uh, in front of the testing arena so that the computer can actually analyze visually how the child robots are behaving and how, how the behavior can be uh, evaluated with respect to the fitness function, given, given fitness function. Um, but also the control PC can communicate with the, um, the robotic modules given uh, here. So the blue module here has uh, a communi wireless communication capability with the, uh, the control PC such that control PC can give different control parameters to the uh, child robot. So the robot can adjust its own motor uh, control parameter at the same time um, while they're you know, adjusting uh, or optimizing morphological uh, structure. So, uh, so with this system, the mother robot can generate hundreds and hundreds of uh, real-world robots um, to explore different morphology. And I just want to show you some of the interesting examples we found uh, through this experiment. Um, so here in the video that I um, can show you, so in the first case, the robot used only two uh, modules, so one active module and, and one passive module. So the black um, cube is basically uh, the passive wooden structure. But just by putting these two uh, things, already robots start moving. Uh, nothing, you can just show all this video at the same time. 
Um, and then if you have two cubes uh, or five cubes, um, the robot is already uh, showing quite interesting uh, commotion uh, behavior. So the fitness function we use for this optimization experiment was the uh, locomotion distance and given time. So basically, the fastest locomotion, the, the faster the locomotion is, the better the fitness uh, evaluation is. <laughs> and by using this um, uh, the system, uh, the robot can, uh, this mother robot came up with all this solution without human intervention. So all this design that you're seeing in this video are done, uh, designed by robot without any human intervention. And we didn't even use the simulation. So this is the pure real world uh, um, evolutionary robotics we uh, did so far uh, in our uh, laboratory. So um, I, I hope you see the power of evolutionary robotics uh, also in the real world in this uh, in this experiment. Um, and but obviously there are a number of dead body on the way. So if you look go to the next slide, uh, we see that it is all uh, unsuccessful cases. So these robots, for example, in the top left corner, you know, in the evolutionary process, there can be some. Um, um, unfortunate situation, like one cube put in the middle of the arena in the wrong orientation that it doesn't do anything. Um, but some other cases, like top left corner, we have a two cubes. It's a relatively sophisticated robot, but uh, it's not very successful because uh, successful locomotion because it doesn't have enough um, uh, stability and so on. So there are uh, many, many dead bodies like that on the way, but uh, fortunately, um, there are uh, some successful cases. So um, if you go to the next slide, uh, we just want to uh, show you how the evolutionary process actually looks like. So in the first, um, yeah, okay. So in the first uh, generation, uh, the mother robot generated 10 random uh, morphologies and put in the environment. Uh, and see how the locomotion works. And some of them, most of them are very bad. So the, the, the number shown in the top left corner of every robot is basically a fitness function, how much robot travels in, in a given time. Um, and evaluated the, uh, ev the, the fitness evaluation was used to select the, um, um, the, the selection process. So here we picked up three uh, top scored robots to do uh, elitism selection as well as crossover and mutation um, selection and generated another 10 set of uh, robots to do another uh, experiment. <coughs> Just by repeating this uh, <clears throat> um, process again and again, after 10 generation, we usually have a better um, fitness evaluation on average, and that gives actually the evolutionary uh, process successful. So if you go to the next slide, we have a complete picture of the, um, uh, the largest, largest experiment we did. So we did uh, the largest experiment with 500 trial and errors. So the mother robots build 500 different different designs uh, over about three or four weeks and evaluated the robots uh, in this manner. Um, um, so the important uh, component of this experiment that we uh, encoded the building process of the robots um, rather than complete design of robots. So in the case of um, uh, Carl Sims experiments, uh, he encoded only uh, partially how the robot, child robot should be built. But in our case, that we need to build the physical robots. We have to encode the complete building process of child robots in the genome. And, and uh, in, the, in every genome, it has uh, um, the mod module type as well as construction process and the motor control parameters. And that gives um, almost infinite uh, variations of uh, robot morphology and control parameters uh, in this charge space. So um, by using five cubes, we are able to uh, around 10,000 or 20,000 uh, significant different morphological uh, structure explore in this, um, um, in this setup. 
Um, and fortunately, um, so this is the, um, the results we got so far. So here we have um, um, the, the fitness evolution of a generation. So we only have uh, 10 generations because of the real world experiments. Uh, but fortunately, we uh, have or, you know, already observed the improvement of fitness value only after uh, 10 generations. Uh, and that gives already a very optimistic um, perspective for this uh, direction of research. Usually evolutionary robotics requires thousands or tens of thousands of uh, uh, trial and error to see something significant. But if we choose the right setup, uh, just like in our case, uh, the 10 generations could be sufficient to improve the, um, uh, some functions. Um, and in our case, we saw, in the worst case, we even see like a, a 30 or 40 percent increase of uh, performance, but other cases, you can already see 200, 300 uh, percent increase of the um, uh, performance. So this is not only about the, um, so the evolution is not only about accumulative improvement of um, behavior, but also the qualitative um, difference in behavior. So here is uh, four representative different gait patterns we saw in this, our experiments. So some of them are relatively simple behavior, like shuffling behavior shown in this black uh, trajectory. But, but others are quite uh, stable commotion behavior like uh, shown in red and the green uh, trajectory. But our favorite is actually this, uh, the blue one, which is more chaotic uh, commotion behavior, which is usually difficult for human engineers to design it, but um, the mother robot, uh, the robot inventor can do this kind of, be, uh, design this kind of behavior somehow worse, so even though uh, we don't really know why, um, simply because the mother robot is doing heuristic search rather than uh, um, uh, systematic design um, of the um, child robot. So I think I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to go more into detail, but we got the recently uh, significant um, uh, media coverage uh, by BBC and other um, news media and saying that um, interesting way to describe our research, uh, the mother robot built evolving baby robots or unnatural selection. Uh, some uh, newspaper says, uh, I'll be back because this is the evolution of robots and, and uh, I'm trying to associate our work with the Terminator movies. Uh, but of course, you know, this is uh, still uh, far-fetched uh, description of our work, uh, but I think we made quite a significant interesting uh, first step how evolutionary robotics can be done in the uh, real, ro uh, real world environment. And uh, we of course saw a lot of challenges here, but um, um, I'm, I'm hoping that we can make an interesting research direction um, on top of this um, the technology we made. So um, I don't want to uh, go farther with my presentation, so I, I, I'd like to stop here, and then I hope I give you some ideas about how challenging the morphology changing robots are, uh, but once we're done, we can do a lot of interesting research uh, on top of these technologies. So I hope uh, I, I gave you some flavor about what kind of research we're doing and where this is going in the future. Um, and I would like to stop and I would like to um, um, yeah, open the floor for a question if you have. Thank you very much for your um, uh, Okay. Thank, you Thank you very you much for your yeah. fascinating talk. Um, yeah. Who has any questions? Maybe I can start with the first question um, about the um, the inventor robot that does the child robots. How did you unglue all the robots? Did the robot also do that, or you had to do that by by hand? 
How did you uh, so, Yeah, well, that's actually a very a good question. Uh, almost everything is automated. Uh, that's why we have only few students to do you know, 500 robot experiments. Uh, but what is not uh, automated is actually the disassembly of child robot because we cannot obviously uh, have so many materials to be a robot. So we are recycling all this robotic cube, but the disassembling is done by human. Um, and the charging of battery is another uh, challenge. Um, but that, that's something we can probably uh, cope with if you have some autonomous charger. Uh, other than that, um, the repairman, the, the repair of motor, repair of um, uh, structure is also a challenge. So there's still some significant challenge how to manipulate uh, physical objects by uh, mother robots. But um, so those are things that you know still remaining te technical challenges. Uh, but that's something uh, we uh, want to collaborate with the robotics engineers around the world because you know the manipulation is of course one of the uh, still unsolved problems, and, and if you have any good ideas to implement technology in our system, I'm very open uh, to suggestions. Yeah, I have a, a question too. Uh, may, uh, Fumiya, um, may you, uh, did you uh, any comparison with uh, experiments by uh, Bongard? Because actually it seems that you, what you do essentially is to embody uh, Bongard's simulation uh, to a certain extent. So uh, uh, did you notice uh, a significant so uh, benefits, so the difference between the real, real world and the simulation? Had you time to check it? Yeah, well, th thanks for the question. I think I think this is a very important question, actually. Um, and uh, actually, at the moment, I have a, a couple of students working on the simulation environment using very similar setup like Josh Bangar's uh, experiments. Um, and uh, we are in the process of replicating uh, the, the robots using the same genome that uh, Mother Robot came up with. Um, at the moment, uh, the difference in uh, fitness evaluation is uh, very large. So even if it's very successful in the uh, uh, model or the real world experiment, uh, tend to be very unsuccessful in simulation environment. Um, the, the reason is uh, largely because of the, um, the, the uh, friction. Uh, parameters in uh, physical simulation. Physi uh, this physics, uh, the, f the physics of friction is very difficult to simulate, uh, and, uh, and it doesn't really scale with many different contact points and so on, for example. So at the moment, the real relation uh, gap is very large, but obviously this is uh, going to be another big research challenge. Once we know how to deal uh, reality gap, then um, the simulation is going to be very powerful. Uh, supplementary technologies, uh, complementary technologies to improve our uh, evolution in the, in the world. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have actually many other questions, but uh, probably we, we are running out of time as usual, but really very interesting. I'm happy to receive any uh, emails questions, so I'm, uh, please send me and uh, well, thank you very much. Okay, count of me, <laughs> I will sign. <laughs>